Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. The Nittany Lions marched into Philly on the heels of a streak that dates back to 1941. Temple fans had reason to believe that all streaks eventually end, and an elusive win was in their grasp. Penn State's defense remained relentless throughout, changing their second half flight path. The offense continued to search for a way to elude a game Temple squad. The focus was to stay on the flight path. For one Nittany Lion, the fourth quarter was the time to seize control, setting up the game winner in the waning moments. The prayers of Nittany Nation were answered, keeping Jopa's record flawless against the Owls. Presentation of Huddle Up Nittany Lion fans on your local public television station has been made possible in part by TNB Medical, 3604 South Atherton Street State College. Scooters, stair lifts, and service. Information at tnbmedical.com. Penn State. Penn State. Penn State. Now, we are Penn State. Hi again, everyone. I'm Steve Jones, and welcome to Huddle Up, Nittany Lion fans. Saturday's game at Temple, certainly not a work of art, but in the end, a victory makes the painting look so much better. Now the Nittany Lion football team gets ready for Eastern Michigan. The key plays in the game, let's take a look back to the Lincoln Philadelphia. First of all, Rob Bolden, big play to Derek Moy, one of his seven catches for 112 yards in the ball game. Silas Red, fifth career rushing touchdown, his fourth this season. He had 85 yards on 16 carries. And also the Penn State defense, one of three takeaways, including this Michael Motti interception that ended up setting up the game-winning drive. For Penn State, one of the keys, takeaways and a partially blocked punt. The partially blocked punt set up the red touchdown. The Motti interception set up, obviously, the game winner. Let's go back to the key plays as we get to that final drive. First of all, on third down, big catch for 12 yards by Davon Smith to move the chains. Then the fourth down pass. Derek Moy to the 12-yard line. The Nittany Lions had a third down and one, and then suddenly it looked like everything went awry. But Penn State recovered the fumble, and the decision was made by Joe Paterno to go for it on fourth down. Second, third effort by Brandon Beecham to pound it to the one-yard line, and that set up the game winner by Michael Zordich over the right side, and the Nittany Lions walk out of the link with a 14-10 win over Temple. I now bring in my broadcast partner for the last 12 seasons on the Penn State Sports Network, Jack Ham. Jack, great to have you with us. And Jack, when you look at the Penn State defense, Joe Paterno always wants to see a constant improvement in his defense. Is he seeing that improvement? And if so, where? I think he's seeing improvement in, in every part of his defense. He's seeing the front four getting the pressure they need. And you get pressure with four guys up front. Uh, you can do a lot of different things in that secondary with your linebackers and your defensive back. And I think he's got to be really pleased, especially with the guys inside. And, uh, and making a play at the end of the game. Stanley on that fourth down play, using that speed rush up the field, making a play, rotating all those guys. I think he's really confident in the fact that they got a number of guys in that defensive line who can play and play effectively. Linebackers, you're getting big plays out of Maudie making an interception in a key situation. Linebackers getting a feel for the passing game. And then you have secondary with, you know, uh, Powell with the interception as well. He wanted turnovers. They got the third and long situation with Temple, and they were in control. They knew what they wanted to do, dropped off in zone coverage. So guys making plays on that defensive side of the ball that builds confidence, that builds an identity for this defense right now, I think Joe's got to be very pleased the way they're playing. When you have a series of veterans on defense, you start to play instinctively. Are we seeing those instincts come into play with this veteran defense? 
it, it's starting to get that way right now because when you when you, you time up blitzes, Hodges almost had a play coming off the edge where you kind of got to feel the cadence, you know, the defensive lineman on the outside gives him an alley to come off the edge, those kind of things. Also, I'll tell you what else is the fact of how the rundown defense. Guys are being patient and holding their lanes, guys on the outside who are making sure they have containment. A couple of plays by Astorino, especially in the, in the bubble screens on the outside, not only taking on the blocker, but containing, knowing where his help is, and in fact, he ends up making a tackle, kind of knowing the guy's inside will force it out to me. I, in turn, contain it. That's just good team defense against the run. And after that first drive against Temple, that defense played outstanding football. You and I talk all the time about special teams being one-third of the game, changing field position, garnering points, making big plays. You look at Penn State special teams, what needs to happen? Well, there's a number of places in the special teams that need to be helped. I think, number one, we've got to make sure we catch punts uh, when they're up in the air. Uh, we cannot allow them. I mean, there are times where there's a bad punt, it'll hit the ground. But our defense, the deep guys have to make sure they handle that. We didn't handle the punt by Brown. It ended up being a, 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 a the ball hits the ground. Then we get the penalty as well. In that series, we thought we'd get the ball around a 40-yard line. We're inside of our, I think, are inside of our five-yard line. That's number one. We got to get better job of, of field goal. We cannot situation where we kick a field goal and you know to tie a game up, and, but we decide to go for a fourth down. Joe's obviously not confident in our our kicking game one bit right now. So those things have got to do. You know, we have to do a better job. Usually, when you know there's three aspects of the game: offense, defense, and special teams. You know, special teams and offense was a lost situation for us. We won that game truly on our defense. All right, let's get to the offensive side of the ball. When you look at the guys like Silas Red, Derek Moy, Justin Brown, do you see an offense that does have potential playmakers? Oh, I, uh, there are playmakers out there. Moy on one side, and, you know, making a big play, got called back on the holding call, which was a good call. But Justin Brown is starting to feel it on offense, I think. You know, catching a ball inside. He's big, big wide receiver, a good target for either quarterback. Hangs on to the football, made a couple of tough catches inside the, you know, the hash marks in there where you're going to get a couple of collisions. He got banged up a little bit, but then came back in the game. Like I said, he's a big wide out, tough kid as well. He's starting to get a feel for it as well. But we need more guys, and especially in our offensive line. Our offensive line's got to do a much better job of running the football. We had a couple of good runs, but a lot of it that was a crack for Sadis Red, the 17-yard touchdown. I think he had a 21-yard run as well. But we've got to do a much better job with our offensive line. When you get into the Big Ten schedule where you got to knock people off the line of scrimmage, I'm not sure Joe Paterno is confident our offensive line can do it. And that is State of the Lines, as always, presented by the Student Bookstore. Jack, thank you very much. And Jack will join me for the broadcast Saturday beginning at 1030 outside the Jordan Ticket Center with the play-by-play -play at noon. Let's get to some tweets from the past week. Quinn Barham, tough game, almost killed ourselves, but fortunately we were able to pull it out. We are. Well, Jay Paterno, tough day, but a good win. Something to build on. A lot to learn from. Grew up in some ways today. And Jerry Kill, great to see him back on the sidelines for Minnesota. His first win as the Golden Gophers head coach. Enjoyed the visit Monday with Bobby Knight. Says they're both old school coaches. Indeed they are. And don't forget, you can always follow us with Twitter at Huddle Up Lions. We had four major penalties which were the careless, that, that uh, hurt us uh, when we had the ball offensively. But I think when you look at the tapes of uh, the Temple game, you realize, you know, so many times when I looked in there, there'd be seven, eight, nine guys in, in those red uniforms on top of the guy. They, they really hustled, they played well. We just got to be consistent uh, in all phases of the game. Some days, some things we do, we're doing very well. Uh, and then the next week we might drop off in that area and something else comes up. I could blame it on youth, but I think you can only be young so long. I think we've got to, you know, I think I've got to do a better job maybe in the fact that they're going to discipline them a little tougher maybe. I don't know. The Big Ten Conference Call, supported by the Penn State All Sports Museum, located at the southwest corner of Beaver Stadium. Information on Facebook and at gopsusports.com slash museum. 
Final non-conference games coming up as Big Ten play begins next week. We start out with Ohio State and Colorado and Columbus. Ohio State paid $1.4 million and a guarantee to Colorado to play this game. We bring in now the play-by-play -play voice of the Ohio State Radio Network, Paul Keels. Paul, after the loss to Miami, now 2-1-1, is Ohio State in search of that personality, that identity? Well, it does, Steve, and I think the big question now is uh, what kind of decisions are going to be made on who's going to play positions like quarterback, wide receiver, things like that, uh, knowing that in a couple of games you do get some people back that could be of help. But uh, this is a team that really is still trying to figure out exactly who they are in the Miami game probably created more questions after the fact than there were before the fact. You mentioned during that answer Joe Bowserman and Quentin Miller, a quarterback. Uh, what's the importance of that playing out for Ohio State? I think so. Um, you know, the problem you have is uh, you have a fifth-year senior who's not played a lot prior to this year, and while he's not turned the ball over and he's, you know, not created major mistakes, he hasn't really made plays for the most part that have really helped. And then you have a true freshman who at times shows real sizzle, but in one game has shown a real propensity for potentially turning the football over. So it's it's a real tough position for the coaches to try and figure out uh, whom they're going to go with or is it still going to be uh, using both of them in whatever situation they feel both need to be put in. Colorado, by the way, 1-2 and two in the season. They will play in Columbus on Saturday. All right, Louisiana Monroe going to Iowa City to take on the Hawkeyes. Iowa last week dramatically came back and beat Pitt. It looked like they were down and out, losing the game at 1.24-7. Came all the way back to win the football game last week. So Iowa has its final tune-up there in Beaver Stadium to take on the Nittany Lions October 8th. Well, San Diego State and Michigan, one of the more intriguing matchups of the Big Ten weekend. The game will be in Ann Arbor. Brady Hoke, first coach in years to start 3-0 at Michigan against a team he knows very, very well. He took the Michigan job after he left San Diego State. And San Diego State and the Aztecs, again, will be in Ann Arbor to take on Michigan Saturday. All right, let's take you now to North Texas. Indiana. This should be an interesting matchup between the two. Indiana finally getting its first win for head coach Kevin Wilson, beating South Carolina State last week. We bring in the play-by-play -play voice of the Indiana Radio Network, Don Fisher. Don, let's uh, get to it with this team. With Kevin Wilson, it seems like there is a weeding out process that is happening. Well, there's no question there's been weeding. <laughs> the, the biggest thing is that he's playing 25 freshmen right now. Uh, and I say that in the sense that they're not all playing all the time, but he is using a lot of freshman football players, both true freshmen and redshirt. In fact, we're up to 15 true freshmen who have played thus far at some point in ball games, and they've only played three ball games. So uh, there's a buying-in process to what Kevin Wilson is trying to do with this football program. The guys that are buying in are playing, and the guys who are not are on the bench right now alongside him. And those, so that's a big part of what he's trying to do at this point. And, Don, you mentioned buying in with the style of play. Kevin Wilson was the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. Are we seeing that Oklahoma influence in what Indiana's trying to do on offense? Yes, exactly the same. I mean, their their style of offense is very up tempo. They've slowed that down a little bit just because the the kids haven't picked it up as quickly as he would hope or uh, as you might think. But uh, they have they are doing a lot of different things with the spread offense. They look like they line up under center occasionally. Uh, they run the pistol look every now and then. They they run a shotgun. It's so many different things. It's a pretty complicated offense, and it's taken a while for these guys to catch on. I think they're doing a better job of that right now, but he is really trying to get this football team to run the ball more than they've run it in the last several years. And that, we think, is a good sign because if you can run the football in the Big Ten, uh, you've got a better chance of winning games. And for the first time since 2007, the Nittany Lions will go to Bloomington where they'll take on Indiana next Saturday in the Big Ten opener. Michigan State, Central Michigan. Tough one right here because Michigan State, many thought they would go to South Bend, win last week, and said Notre Dame did a great job, beat Michigan State. So it's bounce back time for Michigan State as they take on Central Michigan. North Dakota State and Minnesota, well, at Minnesota they have to feel a lot better about things. Number one, 
Head coach Jerry Kill's back on the sidelines. Number two, they picked up their first win under Jerry Kill last week, so the emotions there, trying to get to two and two before they head into conference play. All right, Illinois, Fighting Illini had a great win last week. Illinois picked up that win over Arizona State, winning 17 to 14. Fourth straight game, they'll be at home as they're in action against Western Michigan. We bring in the play-by-play -play voice of the Fighting Illini, Brian Barnhart. And Brian, when you look at the performance against Arizona State, how uplifting was it across the board, especially on defense? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that a lot of people, even around here, you know, the, the team did go 6-6 six and six and then won the bowl game against Baylor, which which gave some people some optimism. But uh, I think the, the feeling around town going into spring ball and then fall camp and then starting the year was, okay, you did that, very good, now do it again. Uh, and I think a lot of people were kind of in a wait-and-see mode. And the attendance the first couple of weeks kind of reflected that. But uh, we had a great crowd the other night, uh, last Saturday night. Arizona State was in town. They were ranked. They had just beaten an old nemesis of ours, Missouri, uh, the weekend before. And so people were very fired up about it. Uh, they came away impressed, I think, after the ball game with Illinois' defense, uh, which had been a big question mark going into the year. Uh, how good were they? Could they replace Corey Liggett? Could they replace uh, Martez Wilson? Uh, and they've had some guys step up. Jonathan Brown was the defensive player of the week, had a fantastic game, uh, and the offense did enough to get the job done. And, uh, but the real key to the game Saturday night was the defense, and I think people are excited now that with a real defense in this league, as you know, you've got to have good defense and a good running game, and Illinois has both of those. And for the Fighting Illini, their fourth consecutive game at Memorial Stadium in Champaign, and they're off to a great start at 3-0. Wisconsin's off to a great start, but that was expected. They're 3-0 right now. They'll be in action, taking on South Dakota State. That game will be at Camp Randall. They're coming off that win at Soldier Field last week, where they took care of Northern Illinois 41-7. And so far, Russell Wilson, the transfer from North Carolina State, has been as advertised. Nebraska will take on Wyoming. The game's in Lincoln. No, the game is in Laramie. Yes, they will hit the road to go to Laramie to play Wyoming. They'll have to play in the altitude, 7,200 feet, coming off that impressive win offensively last week, by the way, against Washington. Defense, though, for Nebraska has not been up to billing, at least so far. All right, let's take a look at leaders and legends. You can see that's how it winds up. Penn State with Illinois, Ohio State, Purdue, Wisconsin, Indiana. Legends, Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State, Nebraska, Northwestern, Minnesota. That will all start to come into focus beginning next week because for the first time ever, divisions and conference play combined starting next Saturday. The Big Ten Conference Call, supported by the Penn State All Sports Museum honoring the achievements of the men and women who have built the proud tradition of Penn State Intercollegiate Athletics. Information on Facebook and at gopsusports.com slash museum. Great to welcome back an old friend, colleague, and uh, somebody I've relied on for some uh, great football advice over the years, Mark Brennan from Fight on State, joining us via Skype. Hi, Mark. Great to have you with us. It's great to be back, and how cool is this doing it over Skype, man? <laughs> now, we're, 20 years ago, ten year, five years ago, would we ever thought we'd be doing this over Skype? Never would. And not only that, your webcam built right into the laptop, and you, uh, and really, on Skype, you look good. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I look even better on radio, but seriously, it's great to be back, and I look forward to the rest of the season. You sure do. It's great to have you back, Mark. And let's uh, get to it. Penn State sure. Temple Saturday. Joe said going in it would be a tough game. It played out as a tough game. When you look at a team that makes the mistakes that Penn State did and still wins, what does it tell you? Well, I think it's a positive that they were able to pull that game out. And not just that, that they pulled it out, the way they pulled it out. Uh, I had been talking all season, and even last season, that the defense really had to start stepping up and making plays. I think the athleticism has been there for a while. They just weren't for forcing turnovers, and they finally did it. Listen, the special teams uh, really struggled. The offense struggled for most of the game. But when it, when it had to get it done, excuse me, it did get it done in the clutch, and Bolden was able to lead them down on that game-winning drive. Well, let's get to the game-winning drive, Mark, because on that game-winning drive, which followed a Michael Maudie interception at the 44-yard line, they then stepped up and made a series of key plays in the clutch. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, a third-down conversion, uh, a couple of fourth-down conversions. I mean, that is about as clutch as it gets. And that's one of those things that, you know, fans were riled up about that game. There's no doubt about it. And I think there was some good reason for them to be riled up with some of the mistakes that were made. But there were definitely some things there 
that Penn State could build off of, especially going into this next stretch of games. Listen, I'm not looking past Eastern Michigan, and uh, I'm not I'm lo I'm not looking all the way forward to uh, that great stretch of games in November. But I think now this team's in a position where it can slowly build toward November. And listen, with this new division setup. Uh, you know, the key is getting into November with a chance to still win your division. And I think Penn State has an opportunity to do that. All right, let's get to uh, expansion. The ACC accepting Syracuse and Pitt. They're willing to go. And the landscape is changing, it seems, day by day. Your thoughts on expansion? It's obviously, you know, Penn State started this all in the early 90s going to the Big Ten. I think it really shows you how much foresight the folks at Penn State had uh, back then. Uh, the way things are happening now, though, to me, it's just absolutely crazy. I wonder how many of these schools, and I'm not talking particularly about Pitt and Syracuse, because I think, obviously, they have to jump off the sinking ship that is the Big East. But, boy, it is just things are happening so fast and furious, and you wonder if people are taking enough time to really think these things through. People are being forced into moves, uh, and I, you know, you, you just hope for some of these, you know, great programs that it isn't, uh, doesn't end up being a bad thing. Well, 30 uh, years ago, I went into Joe Paterno's office and talked to him about the Eastern All-Sports Conference he wanted to form, and it really does bring up the what if. What if. It may have stabilized everything. Well, he's in a perfect position to say, I told you so. I don't think he will. He's never been that sort of guy, but uh, it's sad, actually, for Penn State fans. I mean, as good as the Big Ten move has been, and I think it's been tremendous for Penn State across the board, I mean, not just in football, but, you know, in terms of all the other sports, uh, exactly what might have been had you had, had the, the other schools, the Pitts and the Syracuses, had the foresight to not just put all their eggs in the basketball basket uh, with the with the Big East way back when and had the foresight to go into an Eastern All-Sports uh, Conference because now as we see it, all of these teams from the East that all used to play each other are scattering. And the thing that's disappointing for fans is, uh, you know, those were some great rivalries, some great matchups. Now it's great to be in the Big Ten. There are some great rivals, rivalries and matchups, but just not quite the tradition. And obviously the travel is so much more difficult. And don't forget, I'll have a live chat with everyone between 3 and 4 on Monday. WPSU.org slash huddle up. And anybody, by the way, involved with Fight on Stake can also join us for that chat as sure. well. This week's predictions, supported by E.B. Enders Millwork and Cabinetry of Huntington, Pennsylvania. All right, let's get to the predictions on the games. Eastern Michigan coming up. So, Mark, as we have done in past years, we throw it to you. And your record, by the way, over the years has been exemplary. That's why we <laughs> allow you to do this. Yeah, you know, I, as I look at this game, Eastern Michigan, obviously not quite the caliber of a Temple, uh, obviously not the caliber of an Alabama. Their two wins are both over uh, Division One AA or whatever they call it now. Really, you know, played well in the first uh, quarter against Michigan, but then got absolutely smoked. I think this is a, a good chance for Penn State to build some momentum. I'm having some fun with the score. I'm picking it 30 to nothing, saying it's going to be nine field goals and a drop kick. I'm just kidding about that. I think Penn State's going to score some points. Uh, they're they're going to remain on the winning track, but I think people will feel a little bit better about this win than maybe they did last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this week's predictions, supported by E.B. Enders Millwork and Cabinetry of Huntington, Pennsylvania. Mark, thanks so much. Great to have you on Skype and look forward to talking to you the rest of the season. It'll be fun, Steve. I look forward to it. And don't forget, you can always reach us here on Twitter at Huddle Up Lions. Always a Nittany Lion, supported by theprinters.com, a unique printing company. It's amazing how much the university has changed and, and uh, really built up you know, since I left. And it's always good to come back because you know what? You get to reminisce and reflect on the good old days when you were here, and I'm always happy to be back. Coach is a legend, as everybody knows. I'm sure you probably hear that thing from all, all his other players, too, but you know, you really appreciate what he's done for you when you get done playing. You know, he's really tough on you while you're here, but at the same time, but he's teaching you life skills, so you take it into the real world. It's home. It's home. That's what I mean. It's just when I come back here, you just have a different feeling because no matter how bad the, the day could be, you come back here and always you know you always feel welcome, and it's a, it's a big family. Good job, a part of arguably the greatest offense in college football ever. ever. Kerry Collins, Bobby Ingram, Kyle Brady, Jeff Hardings, along with Kajana, truly an offense for the ages.
Penn State and Eastern Michigan at Beaver Stadium. Eastern Michigan comes in with a 2-1 record. Their head coach, Ron English, used to be at the University of Michigan. Now back-to-back -back games against Michigan last week in Ann Arbor and Penn State this week. Any benefits? I think these games... Uh, last week at Michigan, this week at Penn State, are, are really help our program. And I think, you know, it's uh, sometimes, you know, a couple years ago or a year ago, I didn't know if they helped our program because of where we were. Now they do help our program. They help our kids grow and understand what it takes to be successful. Uh, so uh, we'll be excited going into Happy Valley. And for Penn State, of course, things to clean up. They want to be better in special teams, want to eliminate the penalties because Penn State had been over the recent years one of the least penalized teams in the nation. They'll need to clean that up along the way as Penn State takes on Eastern Michigan in the final non-conference matchup of the regular season for Penn State. And don't forget, Jack Ham and I will be on the air beginning at 1030. Noon will be the kickoff at Beaver Stadium. And at the beginning of the show, you saw some great photographs. And our thanks to GoPSUSports.com for supplying those photographs to us. On top of that, you can always go to gopsusports.com for all of your Penn State information on every sport at the university, all 31 varsity sports once hockey gets up and rolling. Our great crew here, we want to thank them for the fabulous job they do every week. Jack Ham, Mark Brennan, and the entire crew, we want to thank them for being on board. Penn State and Eastern Michigan at Beaver Stadium. Presentation of Huddle Up Nittany Lion fans on your local public television station has been made possible in part by TNB Medical, 3604 South Atherton Street, State College. Scooters, stair lifts, and service. Information at tnbmedical.com. Penn State. Penn State. Penn State. Now we are Penn State. This has been a production of WPSU.